31%. Now, I'm a visual learner. I bet many of you are as well. So when I see a number like 31%, I need a good visual representation of it. So could I get the first six rows of the audience to please stand up? Now, this is about 100 people, right around 31%. And this is the statistical portion of the population that will die from what is the leading cause of death worldwide. Thank you, you can be seated. <laughs> the leading cause of death worldwide is cardiovascular disease. Now, this is actually a group of diseases that affect the heart and the blood vessels. But this isn't a surprise. Our doctors, health organizations, governments have been warning us for years about the risks of a poor diet, a lack of exercise, and reminding us that smoking kills. And while these are the three primary contributors to cardiovascular disease, there's a fourth that doesn't get as much attention, and that is stress. Pulitzer Prize winner Rene Dubose stated, what happens in the mind of a man is always reflected in the diseases of his body. And it's true. Stress in the mind causes the blood vessels to constrict, and it raises our blood pressure, elevates our heart rate. Now, one way that we can avoid long-term stress and damage to our heart is through our vacations. Now, I've always believed that vacations are good for us. And I've even heard anecdotally that vacations can reduce our stress and even prevent a heart attack. But I always wondered about the science behind statements like that, the science of vacation. And so a few months ago, I stopped wondering. I partnered with a colleague who had a background in psychology research. And as we started pouring through the materials, Jessica and I noticed something that was really profound that stress relief was a lot like diet, exercise, and smoking. Many of us know what to do, but we don't reap the benefits. One study in particular was a long-term study of more than 12,000 middle-aged men. And at the end of nine years, they concluded that those men who took regular annual vacations had a decreased risk of heart attack and death. Now that's pretty compelling, now, as we looked at the research, we looked more and more, we found a few things that we wanted to share. In particular, we came up with a formula that can maximize the happiness, the stress relief that you get from any given vacation. Now, I can't write you a prescription for a relaxing vacation. I can't tell you what destination or travel companions or activities will reduce your stress. You'll have to do your own rigorous research to determine those things. But in sharing that formula, we think you can maximize the happiness that you get from a given vacation. So let's get to it. The first variable in our formula is anticipation. Now, if you're anything like I used to be, a vacation is something you book very, very quickly when some magical period of time opens on your calendar. And in booking it at the last minute, sometimes you get a great travel deal. But other times, you can't get what you want, or you have to pay far too much for it. Now, this was me until about 2003. And that year, my lovely wife, Candy, sat me down and explained in no uncertain terms that one, I work in the vacation ownership industry. Two, we hadn't taken a real vacation in years. Three, <laughs> I was gonna fix that. <laughs> now, she was right. Every day I go to work and I work to improve the vacations of other people, but I wasn't applying that same discipline at home. And I had the stress but what I hadn't learned to do yet was treat an upcoming vacation and booking earlier as an opportunity to have a kind of a pressure release valve, to be able to look forward on a tough day and say, oh, but at least that great vacation is around the corner. And sure enough, when we looked at the research, we found a great study that compared the happiness levels of vacationers and non-vacationers. And we expected to find a great link between the happiness and the vacation but what we were surprised to find is that the biggest difference in happiness is actually the period before the vacation, not after. And researchers concluded that it is this positive anticipation effect that makes the difference. Now, there can be a financial reason as well. The Airline Reporting Corporation tracks fares for major destinations. Recently, they published that in 2011, the best time to buy a summer plane ticket in and out of Europe was actually five months in advance. 
in and out of the Caribbean, two and a half months. So it can also pay to plan ahead. And the second variable in our formula is relaxation. In that study of vacation happiness, they found that those individuals who noted their vacation was either relaxing or very relaxing had significantly higher levels of post-vacation happiness, and that post-vacation happiness lasted far longer, in some cases up to eight weeks after returning from their trip. Now, to have a relaxing vacation, you're going to need to avoid some of the pitfalls. In Expedia's 2011 vacation deprivation study, over 70% of individuals reported that they checked their work email or voicemail while on vacation. Not good. Now, if I can figure out how to vacation at properties managed and staffed by my coworkers, I bet you can find a way to avoid that device for a few days. The second pitfall that we need to avoid is unrealistic expectations. If you expect no travel delays, perfect weather, well-behaved kids, and that you'll see it all and do it all in one short vacation, you're going to be very disappointed. Instead, set realistic expectations and enjoy the positive moments that come when you easily exceed those expectations. And when those positive moments happen, capture them. Take lots of photos, videos, whatever mementos will remind you of them later, because we're going to return home very soon to all that stress we left behind. Now, when we do get home and that flood of stress comes back, we're going to employ the third variable in our formula, which is capitalization. Now, psychologists define capitalization as the process of one person telling another about a positive event. And this has several very specific outcomes. First, when telling about the positive event, say a great vacation memory, we're storytelling, we're recalling it, and this serves to further cement it in our memory. The second effect is that when the other person responds in an active and constructive manner, it makes us feel even better about the event that we already enjoyed. So by taking just a little time to share our vacation memories with others, we not only feel even better about them, we remember them far longer. Now, one of the ways that I capitalize is that I take our best family vacation photos, I have them done, and we put them all over the walls in our home and our offices. And this all leads to constantly talking to someone and storytelling about a great vacation memory. Others have shared some great tips. One of my favorite, buy a bottle of wine while you're on vacation. When you get home and that stress returns, throw a little dinner party, pop open that bottle of wine, share it with some friends, and tell those stories all over again. And so by booking earlier and leaving time for a positive anticipation happiness benefit, and then avoiding the pitfalls and enjoying a relaxing vacation, and then by capitalizing, telling other people about it later, we can maximize the happiness that comes from that vacation, reducing our stress and improving our health just a little bit. Now, one great vacation is good, but remember, we need commitment to regular annual vacations. And Expedia's vacation deprivation study tells us that we're not so committed. When you look at vacation days worldwide, on average, respondents got 24 vacation days and still left four behind. But in the US, the situation's far worse. Only 14 days of vacation on average, and we still don't use two of them. And let's be real, we don't use vacation days always for relaxing vacations, do we? Now, my hope is, as more people learn about the science of vacation, we'll make better choices. But what excuses do people have for not using all their vacation days? Well, clearly finances are a part. 22% say they can't afford it. Another 16% say they can get paid for unused vacation days. Others are afraid of how they'll be perceived or that some important decision will be made without them. But my favorite response in this whole study, 10% of people say they don't use their vacation days because work is my life. Now, I bet we work with people like that. Uh, they need their vacation the most. <laughs> we need them to take their vacation. <laughs> so by knowing more about the science of vacation, we can make better choices, and we can give our heart a rest. Now, 
Even after my wife Candy talked to me in 2003, we did a better job, we took some more, but I still didn't have a great personal commitment to regular annual vacations. I needed a bit of a wake-up call, and this happened in 2007. I was sitting in an airport, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Um, luckily, I wasn't. And I went, and I talked to my doctor, and you know, it was just one business trip after another, and when I, when I talked to him, I knew things needed to change. And so I did the right things. I lost weight, fixed my diet, started exercising. I now stay about 70 pounds lighter than I once was. And now I remain committed to regular annual vacations. And for my final point, I'd like to share a quick memory from one of those vacations. This summer, my family went to Maui. This is us at the top of Haleakala. And while we were on Maui, we took the road to Hana this great twisty road that goes around the backside of Maui. And we pulled over at this one park, and we heard about this waterfall. But to get to this waterfall, you had to go through a bunch of mud, under some bushes, across this old aqueduct. But we were, we were up for an adventure that day, so we went. We got to the top of this hill and looked down on this awesome waterfall in this big pool. So we made our way down, and we stuck a toe in the water. And it was just a little cold as our son Andrew would tell you here. Now we got in the water because we were up for an adventure. We swam all the way across this pool. We had our photo taken under this waterfall. It was awesome. We got back, we dry off, and our son Adam declares, declares, mind you, that he's not going to get mud on him the entire way back to the car. Now, we get about a minute down the path, and sure enough, his little brother accidentally splashes mud on him. Next thing you know, they're on the ground, throwing punches the way that only two brothers can. Remember that point about well-behaved kids? So we get them up, and we kind of help them back down the path, and Adam hurts his foot on a rock. Now here's his little brother helping him down the path back to the car. Remember they're the ones that were punching each other a few minutes ago? So we get all the way back home, and a few weeks later, I'm kind of thinking about the trip. And I ask Adam, what was the best part of the whole Hawaii trip? You know what he says? Fighting in the mud with my brother. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so what's great about that memory is it strikes me that you don't have to fly halfway around the world. You don't have to spend a lot of money to have a great vacation memory like that. And that memory reminds me of a fantastic quote. A vacation is like love, anticipated with pleasure, experienced with discomfort, yet remembered with nostalgia. Thank you. <laughs>